Hey, this is Eric from Jerome's Dream. This is Jeff from Jerome's Dream, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with another brand new episode. And on the show this week, we've got Mike Taylor, guitar player from the legendary Page 99. And we cover it all. Page 99's history, their initial breakup, Pygmy Lush, the Page 99 reunions, everything they have coming up. It's a great conversation. We talk about the shows back then, the scene when they were coming up, influences, everything. There's a lot of good stuff in this episode, and that is coming up shortly. But first, here's how you can support the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Shirts. We have shirts available for sale at Death Wish Inc. Pick one up. It's a great way to support the show. Reviews. If you haven't left a review yet, do it. Hit that five star button. It's a great way to help us climb in the podcast rankings. Also, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you write a nice review, I'll read it on the air in this section right here. You can leave feedback on Spotify. Let us know how we're doing. And you can always email me at newscenepod at iodinerecords.com. Also, don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. And Iodine has big, big news today. Iodine Recordings is reissuing the one, the only, a revolution transmission from Stretch Armstrong. That's right. Iodine Recordings and Stretch Armstrong have partnered together to reissue a revolution transmission, which has become one of the most iconic and popular hardcore punk records of the early 2000s. And it's been out of print for over 20 years. This limited pressing has been completely redesigned and packaged using elements of the original art, and it's completely remastered for vinyl by Jack Shirley, and he's worked with Quicksand, Joyce Manor, Deaf Heaven, and a bunch of others. Iodine is offering the record in several exclusive color vinyl variants. Now listen, you saw how quickly the Rituals of Life reissue went. This one's going to go quick too. And a Revolution Transmission is a classic, so make sure you get your hands on this today. Also, my band The Darling Fire has some gigs coming up Saturday, August 19th at Amityville Music Hall in Long Island, New York. That's with Loud Sounds, Semaphore, and Screaming from the Gallery. The next day, Sunday, August 20th, we're playing Kung Fu Necktie in Philadelphia. That's with Hold Down the Ocean and Josh Alvarez. And we just announced another gig. This October 26th at the Brass Mug in Tampa. That's with the legendary Madball, along with Love Letter, Hey Thanks, Moving Targets, Illuminate Me, Drawn Out, Blind Tiger. This is a huge show. And look, I've been saying for a long time on this podcast that the mixed bill needs to make a comeback, right? The 90s mixed bill where you'd have a bunch of different bands. Well, it's here. We're playing with Madball. Madball. The Darling Fire, and Hey Thanks, all on the same bill. I mean, come on. You can't beat that. So if you're in Tampa, come down. That's going to be a good one. Make sure you sign up for the Iodine email list. You'll find out about everything. First, record reissues, rare vinyl, upcoming news, everything else. For more information, head to the Iodine Instagram at Iodine Recordings or head to the Iodine website at iodinerecordings.com. Also, don't forget to support this month's sponsor, New Morality Zine. NMZ is a Midwest-based zine and independent record label specializing in hardcore, post-hardcore, and alternative music. Pre-orders are up for Curse the Knives. Thank you for being here. There's a New Morality gig at Beat Kitchen in Chicago. That's on September 13th and it features Restraining Order, Gum, and some other great bands. Check that out if you're in Chicago. Stateside have a second single out called If You Were Still Here. That's from their debut, It's What We Do. 
and it's out now. It just came out July 31st. Ozone tapes are available in the NMZ web store. They're a great hardcore band out of Fort Worth, Texas. Check that out. And remember, you get 10% off any order in the NMZ web store with the code New Scene Pod. That's all one word, New Scene Pod. For more information, head to the NMZ Instagram at New Morality Zine or head to their website at newmoralityzine.com. Okay, so check back in with me in segment three. I'll tell you everything that's going on with me. I went to a gig this past weekend. I saw Soft Kill and Military Gun at the Rainbow Room of all places. Didn't even know they were doing shows like this, but that was awesome. I'll cover that. I'll cover everything. But right now, we are going to speak to Mike Taylor of Page 99. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with Mike Taylor. Mike, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you, Keith. Thanks for having me, buddy. Yeah, Mike, it's great to have you here. You know, you've done a lot over the years. Page 99. I mean, come on. You've got shows coming up with that band, Pygmy Lush. You've done a lot, and we're going to talk about a lot. But Mike, first, I want to ask you, how are you doing today? (laughs) I'm actually pretty good. I'm... um been Mondays are a day off for me. So I spend a lot of the time or at least I have for the last three months as kind of like an admin day for page 99. So I reach out to a lot of the folks we're working with doing shows. Um, we have a beneficiary or two for these shows coming up and then everything from bandmates, band, you know, other band members and people who are helping us with shirts and, and uh, records and everything. So there are busy admin days, but I, you know, they're a little stressful, but uh, it definitely needs to get done. <laughs> it does. It You know, Monday is my work day, too, for this podcast. I always record on Mondays and Wednesdays, and I have to make myself start editing every Monday, which I hate doing still, <laughs> but it's got to get done. Yes, it does have to get done. It's like the, the unforgiving part that must happen. Exactly. Where are you living these days? Um, I live in Berryville, Virginia. It's in the Shenandoah Valley. It's west of DC, probably an hour and 20 minutes west. It's I always call it the country burbs. I grew up in Sterling and over the years I just keep moving further and further west. It's a quiet town. It's um, you know, it's real quiet, sleepy. There's not a lot of food around. So if you're hungry in the middle of the night, there's not much to do. <laughs> but um <laughs> Yeah, there's one grocery store, a couple lights, flea markets nearby, that kind of town. I got you. I got you. That sound that sounds nice. You know, I I live in Brooklyn, right? So uh, I live on a ground floor apartment, and a couple of things went wrong this week. There was like this small outbreak of little flies, and <laughs> last night there was a roach in my bathroom. I don't know where it could have came from. Maybe the kitchen sink. So now I'm like closing the drain every time I wash my hands and sealing up everything to make sure there's nothing else getting through and it's hot and it's and there's noise and I, and I just today I was thinking like man it would it must be nice to live somewhere more serene out in the country you have to drive there's not people walking by your window yelling and it's got to be nice right yeah no it is nice there's one of the, there is no traffic out here which is really nice there's ever traffic. It's usually because of an accident. I uh, I do have a forty five minute or forty five minute commute east to where I work, and yeah, I'll hit some like tra- like accident traffic from time to time. But um, once you you know about a half an hour out, there's there's just nothing. So it, it is pretty nice. What do you do for your job? Um, I've been a kitchen manager, sous chef for a long time now. Um, I've been working in the kitchen industry for maybe 25 years since I was 18, I think. Um, Wow. So slowly, you know, when the bands were very active and I was doing a lot of touring, it was a perfect job to like come home and in between tours, like work for a long time and then take little blocks off to, to do like a winter tour or summer tour. You know, sometimes I would even take almost an entire tour off. So it's, it's an easy job. In that respect, for those years when you're really, you know, when you're really busting your hump out there touring the country and and beyond. But, 
you know, these days I work a lot more and tour a lot less. So it's like, uh, so as the, as the years go by, my position's gone up. So now I've made my way all, all the way up to sous chef or chef to cuisine, uh, just kind of overseeing kitchen management, gen- general management, stuff like that. Nice. So you grew up in Sterling, Virginia. Yes. Yes, sir. Tell us about it. What's it like? Um, Sterling, Virginia. Well, it's, it used to be when we were growing up, um, we moved there in 85 and while growing up, it was a kind of, you know, similar to this, it was a sleepy suburban town. Um, it wasn't even on the map in, in the mid eighties or at least, you know, on a, like a DC map you or the Virginia map, it wouldn't be on there. It is now. But not not a lot going on. It was a small town with uh, one high school, one middle school, a couple elementary schools. But, you know, we made friends and played a lot of music. You know, it's like played music and started playing music in high school and, you know, uh, found our way from there. And then in the years since, I'd say in the ni- late 90s, it's grown up exponentially. And Loudoun County, the county that Sterling resides has been one of the fastest growing counties for the last 25 years, I believe. Like if we have Ashburn and data center hell out here now, it's like the biggest data go- coming through the entire world runs through like Ashburn, which is 10 minutes away from Sterling, Virginia. And talk about your relationship with music. Around what time in your life did you start playing? You play guitar, right? Yeah. Um, I started playing, let me see, um, maybe in ninth grade. Um, I grew up really digging hip hop. So like throughout middle school, I was really a sponge soaking up all that early, late 80s, early 90s hip hop. And I started high school, 93, 94 at the time when grunge was kind of exploding. So there was a lot of stuff like that, a lot of guitar oriented music from there and i I just kind of started picking up uh you know stuff like uh nirvana and dinosaur jr and pearl jam and anything from that era and really like digging it and really it was really my sinking into nirvana that made me want to play guitar so i would say like 94 is when i actually started playing i definitely didn't know how to play i didn't really take lessons i definitely faked and lied to our so some of our friends to let them know that I could play guitar so they would come <laughs> over with their gear and practice with us. But um, as, as, as a result, it would uh, end up, um, you know, um, in our favor. Cause those, those were the Kane brothers who currently play in city of Caterpillar and strike anywhere. So um, those were our first, me and my brother, those, those were our first friends. And we started playing music, but yeah, um, 94, um, and like I said, grunge music really made me want to play and quickly went into stuff, you know, like all the punk stuff, like kind of the more accessible stuff at the time, like Minor Threat and Dead Kennedys, Black Flag, Misfits. And then that went into punk hardcore, like Born Against and Rorschach and, and other things like that. Nice, nice. Yeah, I forget that, uh, you know, I came in on the grunge wave too, but I forget all the great hip hop that was going on too. You know, there was... There was like more mainstream stuff like Naughty by Nature, which was cool. And then uh, Onyx, yeah. I was big into Onyx when their first album came Absolutely. out. That was like so hard. It was so good. Yeah, it was it, it was tough. That's a tough record. I love it. I love that one. Um, I was really into Del the Funky Homo Sapien and Souls of Mischief, um, The Coup, uh, Kill My Landlord. Basically, 90, 1993 and 94 are some of my favorite hip hop records on earth came out. Not, I would say 92 to 94, like the best hip hop game, even, even the mainstream with Ice Cube and Dr. Dre, like some of their, their best records, in my opinion, were of that time. So I really soaked up hip hop and I still love a lot of stuff. So it's, um, it, that, that, that era of music has definitely stuck with me. And then I do seek out through some more, uh, educated friends, more rap or hip hop verse friends um to kind of uh cue me into like newer stuff and i've gotten to a, some newer stuff i really like the new billy woods album and things like that yeah i got into a real hip-hop jag in like 2017 through 18 through 19 i think and i just went into a deep dive and found all this great stuff and 
Uh, not so much anymore, but once in a while I'll hear something and then I have to go find it. And I'm like, yes, this is great. Yeah, absolutely. That's what happened with me with the Billy Woods. Um, Hal, who uh, he, he goes by his Instagram handles, Hal Capone. Some of you guys probably know him out there. Uh, I I know that name from, uh, I see him from my Instagram page, yes. Yeah, he's a, he's a great human, but he's been taken to Instagram since, um, uh, since the pandemic and just interviewing... Uh, the who's who of punk hardcore screamo and and they, i've been delighted watching many of the interviews and partaking in some of them but he, he and i have talked a lot of hip-hop and he he just turned me on to one of his uh spotify mixes and there's just lots of good stuff that i've never heard so it's like always out there i just need to know the right it's just like it always is you need to know the right people you need to know where to look and it's out there <laughs> exactly exactly and as you're talking I remember all of the incredible bands from Virginia. Page 99, of course. You mentioned uh, City of Caterpillar. I've had Ryan on the show. Yeah, I heard that one, actually. I just had Dave from Sleepy Time Trio and Bats and Mice on the show. There's more. Awesome. Just endless good bands from this region. Yeah, uh, um, there's definitely been a lot of good bands in the Richmond area. Like Born Against actually moved to Richmond in, in the late, era of their career and were a Richmond band, which is about the time I got into them. And then, um, you have Ho's Got Cable and Men's Recovery Project, Sleepy Time Trio, Engine Down from like that kind of Richmond area. And then the DC, Virginia, Nova area, as we call it, you know, Northern, Northern Virginia, it's got like a majority role city, Caterpillar, page 99, um, Way full, crestfallen, and just way too many. There's just so many bands from that era and that time, Darkest Hour. Yeah, Hose God Cable, I didn't hear until I was researching Dave. My God, are they good? I love that that style, that that whole scene. That's like a it's like an era that I'm fascinated with because I wasn't around, like I wasn't taking part when all of that was going on. I was a little too young and I was listening to other stuff, but it's it's just all so good. So I love learning about it now. Oh yeah, yeah. That Ho's got I, I believe I've got everything they've released and I absolutely love that band. Completely underrated. I'm just waiting for Numero Group to announce their like discography, Ho's Got Cable discography any day now. But that band, I think they if I'm not mistaken, I, I could be mistaken, but I had heard that they did a reunion at this point years ago, and I wish I was more privy to it at the time than I was then, but, uh, I would have loved to see them, but they're great. They were like one of my favorite bands from like that era and that time, like in that region. Talk about your relationship with punk. Like, uh, where did you come in? What kind of shows hooked you? Like what, what was your thing? Um, well, you know, as I said, like starting with, uh, like grunge worship at the time, like, you know, me and my brother, you know, everything's involved with my brother and my core group of friends, which would be the Kane brothers at the time, 94, five and six. Um, so we would just like soak up 120 minutes and see everything from Sebado to John Spencer Blues Explosion and Sonic Youth and the Cows and Jesus Lizard and ju- uh, just all sorts of noise rock from that era. So my first initial like intake was that, that ilk of music. And then, you know, actually I would say that reading come as you are the, the Nirvana book got me deeper into a whole lot of stuff that I didn't know about yet. Like old Texas punk, like scratch acid, big boys, um, Jesus lizard. And then, you know, stuff like the Melvins and the cows and Killdozer, Laughing Hyenas. So I, I first gravitated towards that. And so at the same, as I was kind of soaking up like all these influences, I guess Nirvana had, <laughs> funny enough, in Black Flag, I would also soak up all that that DC hardcore, you know, being from this area, it's everywhere. So you're soaking up the void and the faith and De- uh, like minor threat and government issue and, and stuff like that. But then um, I'll tell you what, like, as I was getting into that and, you know, we were starting our first punk band, which was in high school with the Kane brothers and my brother, it was called nitpick. And we started in 94, 95. Um, and when we started, we were doing kind of like misfitsy Nirvana power chord kind of songs 
with some influence of some things we were just getting into, like Jesus Lizard and stuff like that. Even though we didn't sound like Jesus Lizard, it was way remedial. But um, I remember a friend of ours, so Eric, uh, Eric Kane, who plays in Strike Anywhere still to this day, he played with these group of guys. He played in a pop punk band called The Abducted. And they were a couple, they had a couple different names prior to that. And their bass player, Todd Imus, was a, was a pal of ours. And um, he, he lent me this tape that had Born Against and Rorschach on one side and then My Bloody Valentine on the other side. And then really from that day forward, uh, I dove hard into like abolition style punk, Gravity Records, you know, Great American State Religion. And then just kind of everything and then all the hardcore that started coming in in the mid to late nineties. But I dove in first with like not the classic nineties punk hardcore, which was um Born Against was was the band that did it for me and, and that Rorschach, that Protestant LP. And then I just kinda that that was very formative for me because that's how I learned how to play punk rock guitar. So all the weird chords that happened with Jesus Lizard mixed with like you know, whatever born against influences were, which were like articles of faith and black flag and maybe early meat puppets and stuff. Like I was soaking that up and just, I'm a music nerd. Like, so I just dove head first and and got way into all that stuff. Nice. Nice. It sounds like a very wide range of influences, which is great as well. Yeah, absolutely. So you're in this punk band. It's the mid, almost late nineties. We're, we're playing. How does this lead into uh, page 99? Well, as I said, we kind of started off sort of like, you know, like a, a mid pace grungy punk band. And then when we got that <laughs> Born Against tape, we all kind of got into it together at the same time um, and listening to other kind of stuff like more hardcore related things. And the band Nitpick slowly started to take shape. Almost it started to turn into what early page 99 sounded where the Songs got a little more uh, aggressive um, and the chords started getting a little more, a little bit different, a, a lot, a lot less power chords and a lot more discordant use of like, you know, guitar stuff. Um, so at the end of Nitpick broke up in 97 and I remember for about a year I wasn't playing in anything. And um, actually how it happened is uh, Blake. Um, who's the sing one of the singers in page 99. Um, he had joined nitpick our high school band um, towards the end. And he became a part of that band. And as we broke up, he went on to try to do something else. And he was friend. This is kind of a funny, he was friends. His girlfriend at the time was friends with Johnny Ward. Who's been the drummer for page 99 the whole time. Johnny Ward's sister. So Blake would end up at Johnny Ward's house on New Year's Eve in 1997. And Johnny Ward was this like younger punk punker kid with had a mohawk. And he used to do a band called, he used to do like a screeching weasel style band called like Chubb. I think they were called Chubb. <laughs> <laughs> well, also with Kevin who played in City of Caterpillar. So there's all these ties that bind with these Sterling people. But um, yeah, um, Blake went over to Johnny Ward's house on New Year's Eve and Johnny always describes it as like, Oh, I'm hanging out with one of the, one of the nitpick guys. Like it was a big deal for Johnny because he was younger. Like Blake was out of high school. Johnny was still in high school, but the two of them, like Blake could play guitar. So he started showing Johnny some riffs and they went into Johnny's practice space and the two of them jammed on New Year's Eve. So after that, Blake had reached out to me I believe me and my brother and said, Hey, do you guys want to do this, do a new band with Johnny? Or at the time we were thinking, do you want to do, keep doing nitpick, but with Johnny? So anyways, we all decided from there to, to get together. I mean, and literally from new year's Eve, I believe page 99's first show was February 28th, 1998. So we played our first show two, two months later, or not even quite two months after they jammed on new year's Eve. Or Chris, it might have been Christmas night, but literally because Johnny's family used to always do a Christmas Eve and a New Year's Eve like party. It might have been Christmas Eve, but uh, <laughs> anyways, I like uh, it's you know it's like everybody's young, 
but it's like we're practicing on New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve, Christmas <laughs> Day, playing shows. I wish it was still like that, you right. know, because then I could have an excuse to like, you know, not go home. I'd be like, oh, you know, the band has a gig. We got to <laughs> practice. Sorry. Well, something's that the the younger folks are still at it on Thanksgiving, New Year's Eve. I mean, they're yeah, they're tearing it. I'm always like, man, they're they're busy. They're playing right through the holidays. But you know, it's you know, it definitely as you get older, some things change, some things don't. But uh, you know, yeah, the the will and drive to play in the wee hours of Christmas Eve, you know, not the same in a basement. <laughs> it's not there like it used to be, but it, it did. So yeah, we um. Blake hit us up and we got, we pulled a band together with like uh, some of the members of Nitpick, which would have been Blake, me, Chris, and then our, our buddy George, who played in a band called Possessed 13 at the time. He did that with my brother. It was like a crust punk band, Mohawk band. <laughs> um, and then um, our buddy TL, who was more of a musical uh, educated guy, and he came at it with a real like, I don't know, he had. He could like play, he played with his fingers and he could do slap. He was really into pro- everything from like Primus to, I don't know, uh, other technical stuff for that, you know, m- like metal and maybe Rage Against the Machine and things like that. He also liked some crazy weird stuff that we got him into. So with, at that point, that was that first incarnation of Page 99. So at first it was two guitar players, two singers, one bass and drums. And that, that happened in 97, 98. So how long did that incarnation go on for? Uh, with just that lineup, not not too long. I would say we did a tour in the summer, a short tour in the summer of 98 with Enemy Soil. Um, we went out to the West Coast with that lineup at the end of 98. And, did, and then I believe by n- summer of 99, we had a third guitar player which would have been Mike Casto, another friend of ours from Sterling. And then we, that was the three guitar players. And then TL would leave the band at some point, just around 2000, late 99, 2000. And we then got Corey in the band um, who still plays with us today. And then at the same time, TL then quit and we got, we got Brandon from City of Caterpillar also in the band. So then we got two two bass players, three guitar players, two singers and a drummer. So, you know, we you know, we first added a third guitar player and then as a joke, almost out of absurdity, we added a second bass player because Brandon wanted was we asked Brandon to borrow Brandon's van, which would have been two thousand, summer two thousand. And he was he was like, Yeah, you can he's like, Can I he's like and we were like, yeah, you can come along or in like roadie and sell merch. And he's like, could I play? <laughs> and we, we laughed I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to. And that's when we got two bass players. And it was just like, uh, and then we thought it was just going to be that. But we loved what Brandon was doing and how, how he added to the band. So that is the lineup we more or less run with today. I was going to ask. Why the two bass players? Do you still have two bass players when you play nowadays? We do. Um, there is no particular reason for the two bass players. It's, you know, it's it was more like just, it was more just like out of necessity then with, you know, like, we'll let Brandon play. This is kind of absurd. But like, I don't know, do bands do this? We already have three guitar players. And the three guitar player thing was more of like a, for layers and volume. Right. Like rarely did the three guitar players break out and do different things they didn't you know um we didn't do anything too technical um we would then go on to try different things but uh when we got the two bass players it was a necessity thing but when we came back to write with the two bass players we ended up like putting them to great use and both brandon and Corey were the bass players on document eight and there's a lot of really neat bass stuff going on in document eight that probably is more interesting to me than the guitar stuff. I mean, the guitars would break off during melodic parts and document eight and do like opposing guitar parts and like really pretty melodies. But the whole time during document eight, there's a lot of bass stuff going on. That's pretty weird. Yeah. That's interesting. If you do it the right way, right. You could do some really interesting things with the dual bass. I agree. And I, if I'm being frank, I, I don't even think we've scratched, <laughs> you know, we never scratched the surface of, 
what you could do. I mean, you know, when you get that many instruments in a room, you can think of it as more orchestral and experimental. Um, Brandon is definitely more of an experimental bass player. So he's done a lot of just sound and scraping and uh, like slides and random stuff while Corey sort of holds down like traditional root riffs or not really root, but he'll hold down like a lot of the rhythm. They'll trade off. There was a lot of opposing bass parts from document eight on. So the bass did make its way. I, I don't think page 99 ever benefited from the best recordings. I love them and they're all their weird ways like you know but because it's almost like that's what that's what we did that's all we that's all we have but yeah i do think like it's still something that you know people if they to to this day wanted to do two bass players three guitar players could probably do better than page 99 for sure (laughs) (laughs) that's just in my humble opinion i'm sure (laughs) you know but these days i would just make like a a soundtrack with all that stuff like make weird sounds and thumps and screeching whales and stuff like that. (laughs) So 1999 was a very busy year for the band, right? We have two splits that came out, Document 4 and the first release, and or the first, I guess it was the demo in 99, right? Uh, Yeah, the demo that I believe came out in 99, maybe maybe 98. I I can't quite remember. How old are you in 1999? Um, Let me see. I was probably 20 wasn't quite 21 yet. Okay, so that's young. And that's a good uh, that's a good uh, year in life to be out doing a bunch of touring and all this stuff, you know? Yeah, they were definitely the formative years. You know, people go off and they have the experience in college, which I do think means a lot because it, it's a lot, you know, for a lot of folks, it's leaving the nest and finding either new friends or cementing friendships you already have. And sort of just discovering the world, be it whether you are living on your own for the first time or traveling. And during those years, Page 99 toured hard. And that's what we, you know, that, those were, you know, I learned a lot in those years touring. Yeah. You know what? As you're, as I'm listening to you speak, when I was 20 years old, I failed out of college and it wasn't even anything grand like, well, I guess I did party too much, but I wasn't a party animal in college. I barely had any friends. I really didn't like it at all. And I I left after one semester away to go out on tour with my friend's band and sell merchandise for them. And that was one of the most formative times of my entire life. And if I really want to get into it, probably led me here. So yeah, that that's that's a great formative time. And now that I think about it, I'm actually glad I made the choices that I did. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I'm right there with you. What what band did you tour with? Uh, you ever hear this day forward? Yeah, I know that I know the name. I can't say if I've heard of it or heard it or not. They were around in the late '90s, early 2000s, and I did a couple tours with them. And then a couple of those guys went on to form Circus Survive. Okay, who they were around for a long time. Yeah, I remember Circus Survive. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's you know, you for me, it was like traveling and being in cities. You know, I, I was pretty. You know, I was pretty sheltered and, you know, growing up in Sterling, I would say like, so traveling is and being in different cities and in different scenarios is, is definitely like an eye opening experience. And I, I, I couldn't share it for the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of made me, like you said, it's made me who I am today and definitely grateful for it and c- cemented lifelong friendships, which are still, you know, moving forward. Yes. Yes. So, um, what kind of shows were you playing at that time? I'm I'm interested in what you guys were doing because all right, ninety nine two thousand, there was a lot. There was like a metalcore thing popping off, so I was going to a lot of those type of shows. Right, you know, it was basically just hardcore shows. But talk about the types of shows you were playing, what they were like, what the people were like. I'm I'm curious because I was I was very. I was just very involved in one thing at the time. So I missed out on a lot of other stuff that was going on. Yeah. Um, you know, that is a, that was a very, that time is interesting because I think it's the dawn of the internet and people using things like, or like hotmail and AOL and stuff like that to reach out. So I think, I think there's something very interesting and a lot to be said for that particular era of music and literally just because of the internet and, and, you know, email. So you could reach out to bands you never thought you could reach out 
with before. I mean, when I when Page 99 first started in 98 and 99, even though email was I was just starting to use AOL Messenger and email, I still looked in the back of records for addresses and phone numbers and still used Maximum Rock and Roll Book Your Own Fucking Life to reach out to bands that were touring at the time in different areas, different regions. So it, it changed a lot for Page 99. When when Page 99 started, we were really like well received and loved in the grind community. So our first show ever was with Enemy Soil and Pig Destroyer in Philadelphia. Wow. Where at? Uh that was in Stalag thirteen. That was that was the one that's February twenty eighth. And we um Zed played Burn the Priest who would turn into Lamb of God. And uh, Cattle Press played. It was an amazing show. Awesome. Yeah, that's the first, that's like the first real venue in Philly where I went to a show when I was young. I love that venue. I saw so many cool, I saw Refuse there, Discordance Axis. Yep. Um, I just saw tons of, uh, we went up there a lot to Philly. Um, Corey and I actually, and JR, uh, who sings in Pig Destroyers from Sterling, he's a been a good friend to a lot of us for a long time as well and we used to go to a lot of me Corey, and jr would go to a lot of shows we'd go to new jersey philly delaware um and we did a lot of the hardcore stuff in the beginning like went to see converge turmoil uh dead guy ink and dagger um just yep. all those that. were all the shows i was at but then i look at flyers back from that time and i just see you know like all the other bands like uh like you guys, City of Caterpillar, uh, Seisha, uh, I don't know, like like all of that type of right. stuff. And I'm like, man, like all of that was going on too, and I could have went. Right. And so that's, you know, right at that time, you know, I found out about like Reversal of Man through Enemy Soil. So while yeah. we were starting and playing with a lot of grind, like Benum, and then we played with some Doom bands like Newthcrush and played with Dystopia, a lot of like black and punk and cross and stuff, um, which we grew up loving. We love that stuff. But then we would, you know, for me, I guess that that reversal of man side of the enemy soil split turned me on to what then was what was was before, you know, people called Screamo Screamo. And then I came across like Union of Uranus, like double seven inch. And, you know, I kind of thought of stuff like Angel Hair, Screamo and but this was, I, we used to call it like chaotic punk or, you know, experimental chaotic punk, like spazzy punk. And then as more and more bands came about, like from like Antioch Arrow and Heroin and stuff, like those bands were all ending. So I didn't really get to see, they were all ending in the mid nineties. So I didn't really get to see them, but I did see, you know, we then started playing with, uh, you know, we didn't play with Reversal Man. I did see them, but, you know, we played with, uh orchid jerome's dream um love lost but not forgotten uh yes songs of zarathustra and to dream of autumn um you know and it was all regionally based like screamo happened really fast because that just seemed to be the next facet of hardcore adjacent to like metalcore you know like and i know you know i've known kurt from converge for a long time i know for sure that kurt loves all that music and you know, he's, yes. he loves stuff like Drive Like Jehu and, and all the like Gravity Records punks. So like, you know, it's funny, like the, you know, and he recorded a lot of those bands like Jerome Stream and Orchid and stuff. So, you know, it's funny because these two scenes kind of like would intersect every once in a while and sort of be influenced, you know, they would have influence on each other. We played with like Force Fed Glass and it was, like I said, everything was regional. Um, yeah, like uh, they splintered off and they would not intersect too much. Like I liked how the other group looked, you know, like the the black dyed hair yeah. and the and like I so I copped that look, but I, but I would go see like Turmoil and Converge and okay. Poison the Well and all that stuff. Like That's that, awesome. those are those are the shows I was at. Yeah, no, I mean, and they, you know, so yeah, I remember that, like the black skinny jeans and the white belts and the big belt buckles. Like, you know, we played. Um, the more than music fest in Columbus a uh, couple years. And that would, I mean, they did like amazing lineups, but they also were, uh, had the who's who of like, like the screamy hardcore early on. Like, you know, right. they had like the blood brothers and 
uh locust and you know his hero is gone or reversal man i mean just everything and then all the kind of all the melodic like hardcore screaming stuff too that i can't even name them all but yeah and they so we like played a lot with the grindcore and in the punk and then occasionally we would play really random shows where we'd end up playing with like earth crisis or 10 yard fight or um i don't know we played with like most precious blood and the crow mags and coming correct we've played played a lot of like shows like that but how would you go over at those gigs (laughs) i mean surprisingly better than i would think because i feel like at the time that style of music was pretty fresh if I'm being like completely honest, I feel like some people like, for instance, when we played with the Crow Mags, this was towards the end of our our existence. They were pretty cool. They were pretty cool to us and said it was a great set. It was a totally separated crowd. It was just like all, you know, like jerseys and shorts and like backwards hats and stuff like that. And then all yeah. black, you know, all black, you know, punk kids, you know, like completely divided crowd but you know i really appreciate actually how eclectic those particular five years we played that we originally were a band uh, that all the bands we played with were you know we played with a lot of different bands but the screamo scene as it now is known um was definitely the most um supportive those bands would play one or two with each other and then try to play everywhere with each other like you know, depending on where we were touring, we would play with whoever was in a screamo band at the time. Yeah, I don't remember anyone being particularly mad at bands like Page 99, like Fuck Them or That's Not Hardcore or whatever. Like if bands like you were on a gig, like you were just there. But I I don't know, some of the bands I liked, uh, there would be purity tests and it would be like, you're not real hardcore. This isn't hardcore. Like, like, I don't know. It's sometimes that stuff would happen. Yeah. But not know, with, uh, not with like the screamo type bands that I can ever remember. Yeah. Cause it, I, you're right. I, cause I think what, what was deliberate when that scene started, at least with us, like the music was aggressive, but we weren't tough guy hardcore. You know, if there was a, a fight, we'd stop it. We'd separate it. And, you know, we didn't encourage, we encourage people to be safe and take care of each other. You know, we just, you know, we, we grew up seeing like I saw a lot of tough guy stuff and a lot of that stuff age well with me. And some of it, um, I don't like at all much anymore, but I've, I've seen a lot of hardcore bands and I've seen a lot of fights, especially in the mid, mid to late nineties. And then it did like, you know, it did change where it was just almost predominantly for us, like playing screamo shows. Um, and you'd see stuff like that occasionally. I mean, it is definitely a regional thing, um, depending on the scene that was going on. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the stuff kind of exists today in some, in some regard, but I, you know, I don't hear about it, but yeah, I mean, it was a very, it was very regional thing and it was very deliberate, um, for that crowd or those bands to kind of just be anti tough guy, I guess. Talk about the, uh, ethos of page 99. I mean, I've seen that you, and the band uh, donate to different causes. Like, were you socially conscious? Did you have a whole thing going on similar to Seisha and ABC No Rio? And I know those guys got into a lot of uh, different political ideals and uh, social awareness and all that stuff. Were you guys kind of on a similar path? Um, page ninety nine during our initial run, you know, we we weren't we weren't a political band. Um, yeah, we definitely had like those political beliefs like among us. Um, yeah. but we just were more, I don't know, I guess it was a little, you know, Chris and Blake could speak a little more on behalf of their own lyrics, but really it was very more personal, um, more poetic, I guess. And, you know, and obviously politics make their way into that for sure. We definitely dove hard into DIY being important for us because it's, it's the world that we didn't know even existed that nurtured nurtured our band and and how we were able to actually do page 99 for five years. Um, so we did uh, cling hard to DIY ethics and in, in, in a lot of ways and mostly still do um, page 99 still doesn't, you know, we've never had a booking agent. We still don't have a booking agent. Not, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I actually, ha- it's, it's been me booking the band forever. So half the time uh, I could probably use the help more or less these days, but 
Uh, Do you? Uh, here's a question for you. Do you ever wish you had a booking agent? Because I'm just trying to book a simple weekend of shows for my band now and god do i wish we had a booking agent it's really hard <laughs> um you know that's that's a that's a good question because uh, there are two equal parts of me and one wants to say absolutely yes um because you know i i work full time i you know i work for a living these days so i don't have the time i used to in my 20s and in my early 30s um when money wasn't such a factor but at this point like I told you, I use Monday as an admin day. And if I don't use that day entirely, I'll be behind. That's just on emails and texts and, you know, just, just common, um, uh, communication with, you know, everything a band that a band has going on. And then at the same time, I want to say no, because I, for better, for worse, I can be a little bit of a control freak. I, I think I am at least in an arena where I care about it. So like, you know, I want to have control, but it's because I really do care about all aspects of the band and I want them to be handled as uh, personally as possible. You know, I mean, like right now, for instance, um, we've been working with Paul, who just started Paul, um, who used to do Perpetual Motion um, Machine Records. Um, he now does Persistent um, Persistent Vision. And he's handling the reissues of document eight and the singles. And it's just been he and I on the phone just for an hour or two at a time, just talking about every detail with the record that, you know, we can think of. And I really appreciate that. Um, And that's pretty much how page 99 is operated almost entirely. Like every label we can get on the phone and talk about every aspect of it. So, I mean, that's kind of how the bands always operated, but you know, I do know that there are booking agents that um, that work really closely with the band and do. I mean, I I think the idea of a booking agent in a way has changed for the better um, in the last decade than it than it used to be. You know, twenty years ago or more, um, it seems like bands or bands have a lot more control about what they do, or maybe they share duties with uh, with a booking agent. It's a case by case situation, but I I understand your pain. So page 99 goes strong until about 2003 for our first run, yes? Yeah, yeah. Our flash shows were May 2003. So what happened? We decided to break up. What was going on? Um, You know, it's funny because to this day, I still actually talk and reminisce with some of the guys and even my wife about what happened. And, you know, if I wasn't such a kid, then for me in particular, all of us actually, but I feel like if the band had just kind of um, – uh, slowed down a little bit and let, let, um, I guess maybe let disagreements and fights kind of resonate and, um, let the dust settle. I think we would have probably been a band for a lot longer than we ended up being. Um, but what happened really is we went, we just bit off more. We could, than we can chew that summer where we, I think we toured from May to October that year and summer of 2002. And we wow. just, we just packed a lot in, um, and then including like at the beginning of the year, we did a winter tour and then we did a, a eight week tour in May, maybe it was seven weeks. Um, I then came home and went on tour. I had been playing in Crestfallen at the time. Um, so I went on tour with Crestfallen for two weeks, came back, then page 99 went to Europe for two months. So it was a long summer for me. Um, I for sure personally bit off more than I can true. Chew, even though it was just a mere two weeks longer than the rest of the guys. But um, yeah, we just had a difficult Europe tour. Um, we navigated um, a, t- a tough situation at a time before, uh, you know, GPS. I mean, thinking about touring Europe before GPS is like mind blowing to me, but We did it somehow. (laughs) Yeah, I say that all the time. Like, I don't understand how people did it. I I have GPS and I still get lost. (laughs) I mean, yeah, (laughs) same, same with me. So we, um, that was definitely a learning experience. The good, the bad, and the ugly, for sure. But we, it was a, it was a challenging time for a group of young, young kids who are still pretty raw and passionate about what they were doing, um, I think drinking was a little bit of an issue for the younger, uh, some of the younger of us. 
Um, I think just like having that access to alcohol to no end um, was maybe a little too much to handle for some of us at that time. And um, that caused a lot of unnecessary fights. You know, it was just, and I think it was, again, it was the, the, ch- the challenge of m- most of us being in a, you know, a foreign place, you know, for the first time together, we were very, when you go to somewhere else, it's very humbling to go somewhere else and not be able to read signs or understand a language and, and really dependent on you. And we were kind of coming part at the seams at the time. And some, each of us were dealing with things in different ways. And I think because there's so many of us, there'd be little different groups and, and some people would be mad at these guys and then these guys. So it was, the European tour was tough on us and we came back and just, just decide not to be patient. Let, you know, I, you know, I think about that a lot. Sometimes I'm like, do I regret it? I don't think I regret it. Cause I don't try to think about regretting stuff like that. But if I know now what I do today, I would let that band just breathe a little bit and take a break and just pick up where we left off, which is why I think it's, it's, you know, us doing all the reunions over all these years is something that's completely doable because we all remain friends to this day. And we, that's good. You know, we started playing music just shortly after together, you know, right after page 99, Pygmy Lust started with like a good bunch of page 99. So, you know, yeah. what do they say? Time heals all wounds. I, I think that's true. And um, yeah, I, I think we, just hit us hit a wall at that point and and decide to stop. Yeah, what is it about being younger? You don't realize, oh, we can just take a month off, or <laughs> if, like if we're not mentally fit, we can cancel this tour and then do it again later. Like I don't know what it is because I've heard that story before. Like two people in the band are like, "You want to be done? I want to be done too. Let's stop." Or it's just right. like a a decision like on the fly, like, okay, we're done. Like you you don't, you just, when you're young, you don't know how to do anything. And like you're saying, Mike, you know, I regret that I wasted so much time when I was young, just getting fucked up and just wasting time and just not doing what I was supposed to be doing. But then I remind myself, I didn't know how to be normal. Like there was no shot when I, you know, up until I, I, up until I was 35, I was a mess. So it's like, how could I ever tell myself like, oh, when you're 24, make these rational decisions? No, right. I, I, did, I didn't know how until a few years ago. Yeah, no, I understand that um, that thought because, you know, one of the things Pygmy Lush, when we got, when we started, which was, um, you know, Johnny was the drummer for Page 99, also playing in Pygmy Lush, and then me and my brother, we just said, this band doesn't break up. We take breaks. And Page, or Pygmy Lush started in in October of 2005. And while we haven't played since 2016, we've never said we broke up because, you know, life just happens and all of us love each other and we want to play music still, but we hit a snag. It was a logistic snag. Like we all still have a great desire to play music together still, but it's like, we're not just going to, we're not going to announce a breakup, but this is what, you know, adulthood looks like when you're playing punk rock, as opposed to like all that, raw emotion of you know you know being young and still growing you know when you're in your early to mid 20s you're still developing like who the hell you're gonna be and uh you make rash decisions you just have to live from uh, learn learn live with it and learn from them which i think the a lot of us have done what's the snag in pygmy lush well you know we recorded a record in 2016 which is still not out i'm hoping at some point soon it will be out but um, we, um, at the time, right after we recorded the record, um, Aaron and Andy, who are partners with two children, so Aaron was our bass player and Andy was our drummer, Andy Gale, they, uh, Aaron decided, so it was tough for them with the, um, with the child care to both, of, for both of them to be in the band. So basically Aaron raised her hand and was like, you know, I have other musical projects. This is the only thing Andy's doing at the moment. I'm going to dip out. And that was kind of right after we did recorded the record and started playing shows out. So that sort of like tripped us up a little bit and kind of right at the same time that happened, the very first page 99 reunion 2017 started to make its way. Like where it was more than just a show. It was like a little tour and that took precedent. And, you know, it kind of laid 
pygmy lush aside for a little while and we worked we concentrated on page 99 all the way till like november that year and then pygmy lush would then play at the very end of the year our last show that we played was just before it was in 2016 with the malady reunion and city of caterpillar reunion so it was pygmy lush malady and city of caterpillar and then that was that we played with that lineup and that was aaron's last show and we were like okay and then we just haven't done anything since but i'm telling you we keep talking and you know mike widman who is in page 99 now with us playing guitar he was he's been in pygmy lush the whole time he wants to do it johnny wants to do it me and chris want to do it so like you know, it's just a matter of like, okay, all these guys want to do it. Like, who do we get to do what? And where do we pick up? Because we have this whole record that we wrote with members who aren't in the band anymore. And what lineup do we reform as? Or do we reform as a as a newer entity with like, you know, like a Frankenstein, which is totally cool. So that it's definitely something we want to do. I mean, we know nothing but talented musicians to be in that band. So hopefully... Hopefully at the end of this year, maybe next year, we can uh, start talking Pygmy Lush. Wow. Yeah, isn't it weird? Like one little thing can change and then that's it for that band until like one other little thing changes and puts it back on course. Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, you know, we you lose members all the time. And when you're younger, you just, you know, that's that was page 99. It was a revolving door of band members for the longest time. And we just made it work. But then, you know, when in our youth, we had that drive is get back out on the road, get in the studio. While we still have that drive for the creativity, we don't have that time like we used to. So everything's a little got to be a lot more deliberate, a lot more organized and like just well handled and taken care of for it to be uh, easy for everyone, you know, be it whether full-time jobs or parenting or anything, you know, um, would be something you would have to balance with doing a band these days at, at our age. <laughs> How was the initial response when Pygmy Lush got going? Because it is a departure from the the sound we know and love from Page 99. I think initially, you know, for the longest time, um, every band that had members of Page 99 dealt with like X Page 99 factor. <laughs> where it, yeah. it didn't live up to what people were hoping for it to be. And that's okay. Totally. I, I get that as a music fan. And I understand that. Um, I do think when Pygmy Lush started, it was still, it had a little bit of the fire of page 99 and the kind of chaotic music. Cause when Pygmy Lush started, we d was deliberately wanting to do like loud. We had been me, Mike Whitman and Chris had been doing mannequin together. And that band was basically hearkening back to our high school days in a way, like we wanted to play power chord grunge music, sort of noise rock, just really straightforward punk and rock and roll grunge. Um, but we sort of, I, we sort of in the, when page 99 stopped and we were just doing nothing but mannequin for a while, like I started missing playing that weird, like aggressive music which I guess we call screamo these days. But uh, I then I was just like, yeah, I want to do another like crazy punk band. And I want, you know, Johnny, I want you to be the drummer for sure. Chris, you got to be a singer. And Mike, you're the guitar player because we've been playing together now forever. Um, so we started that band with the intentions of basically picking up where Page 99 left off. But it did take a very organic turn into like singer, songwriter stuff. Basically, when we started hearing like demos of Chris and Johnny kicking like little, like cool little indie rock tunes or like a cool little folky tune or bluesy tune, like, you know, we're like, let's like interweave these into some of the, the Pygmy Lush stuff. And we did. And then th that started to take control of the band too. And then we, you know, tried our best to balance those two sounds and, definitely dug deep, you know, cause when we were doing page 99, for instance, like document seven has a couple pretty parts where some of the chords are for me are directly influenced from things like three mile pilot, black heart procession type stuff. Um, so we, when we started exploring the quieter realm of pygmy lush, we finally um, reveled in the opportunity to, to expand like our create creative juices and, 
and do something in that vein, which, you know, we, it's, it's still work that we, you know, it's still stuff we really want to do. Cause you know, I don't sit around and listen to aggressive punk hardcore all the time, but yeah, you know, I, yeah. I definitely like a lot of stuff and I definitely want to experiment in sound quite a bit. And Pygmy Lush has a pretty wide canvas of, um, of, you know, a sonic canvas to work with. And it's definitely something, you know, we still want to do and push the boundaries even further of what we had already done. And um, so, yeah, we just started doing that and loving it and kept doing it. I like it. It reminds me of Colesque in that, you know, they were like this vicious, experimental, hardcore, metallic band. But then later on, they would do these like Midwestern folk kind of songs that they would throw into the mix as well. And it really works together. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, and I remember seeing interviews with the singer eight ages ago and they loved like Jesus Lizard and My Bloody Valentine. So I was like, oh, these guys are talking about, you know, and that's just what you come to know, like all these bands that are playing in a lot of the punk, hardcore, screamo world, they like so much other stuff. And, and you know, definitely bands that are around long enough, um, you know, say a band like Converge, you can hear all their different influences uh, of the other material they like, you know. And, you know, so, uh, you know, if you're a band long enough, you, you're – you're going to develop a, a, a sound and then and then develop a new sound and then expand on that new sound and just keep going and going. So you were co-founder of Robotic Empire, the label, yes? I, I wasn't. I mean, though... Um, were you involved with it? I, I wasn't involved with it, but I, you know, it's funny because I, I did read something somewhere about that. And I was like, it's kind of funny because um, I think basically robotic empire more or less or what then was robo dog uh started with andy Lowe, who's from reston virginia um mm-hmm. wanting to release a page 99 record and then you know so he started a label essentially to release page 99 stuff and a split with reactor number seven and then he loved page 99 at the time and you know i guess in a lot of ways the very early beginnings of Robo Dog, ha- I was involved with quite a bit, just be- by virtue of he that he did so many Page Ninety Nine records. <laughs> so I see, but and we just yeah, we we talked a lot. Andy and I talked a lot about bands that we thought were. I mean, Killing. He had an ear for you know. He only put out what he loved, but he was just always kind of a couple steps ahead back then, and putting just knowing what to put out at the right time. You know, he did that all the way, you know, he did that for a long time. Yeah. When you look at the full list of bands on that label, it's a really great and eclectic list of bands. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, he has stuff like Cursive and, you know, Baroness and, you know, Yesu and, you know, Ultimate Warriors and Asan Asaba, Page 99, Daybreak, or maybe Daybreak wasn't on that label but i mean uh just so much stuff yeah it was all over the sacrifice place. poles yeah yeah and the a life and once stuff. lost yeah who are friends of mine yeah a lot of like you know he he definitely put out some of the best like metallic chugging hardcore at the time and he put out some of the earliest like sc- active screamo at the time so he just he was very active and very passionate you know for very many years uh getting that band rolling so or that label. So I, I I think, you know, being involved with it early on, I, I probably am lumped into it, but I would love to take more credit than I did. But Guilty by association. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I did uh, our friends from our youth, um, you know, our buddy Drew did uh, Circle Takes the Square. And when they started, I definitely pushed them on to uh, Andy Lowe pretty quick. And he, he fell in love with them. I was like, you got to put this band out. They're going to be popular as shit. And they are. Yeah, people love them and they're different and creative and, you know, they were doing something very, you know, they were just expanding on the sound at the time, you know, that was happening. They were kind of adding their chapter to it, if you will, and and kind of expanding the sound. So, you know, it was a perfect fit for, for Andy Lowe and what he was doing. The first Page 99 reunion was in 2011? Yeah, 2011 at Best Friends Day in Richmond. Now, how does that come about? You said everyone stayed friends. Do, did there need to be any repair work between people? How did those conversations start? Tell us about that. Um, no, there didn't need to be any repair work. Um, the fest came out. You know, it's interesting because 
you know, people are like, oh, we didn't think you would ever play. And, and then we just say, no one ever asked us. <laughs> so- <laughs> you know what? I hear so many bands say that and it, it's so weird. Like, I remember when Mineral first got back together, that was mind blowing to me. And I was yeah. so excited for that. Absolutely. And they said, oh, no one ever asked us. And I'm like, <laughs> you're kidding me. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. And I love Mineral too. And I sadly missed that, the the round of reunion shows. So hopefully I can catch them when they come around again. But um, yeah, I mean, so Blake was living in Richmond at the time. And then Tony Foresta, who plays in Municipal Way still to this day, um, he, I think that was either his fest or he was, he either led the pack on that one or was quite involved with it. Um, but he asked Blake if Page 99 would play. And then Blake asked me and, you know, all it took was just asking everybody else. We hadn't thought about it. I mean, we've thought about it. Um, but it really does just take somebody's interest. I, I swear to you, like you, it doesn't hurt to ask a man. I mean, you, you know, I, for instance, I've asked Will from Orchid just about every time we do a reunion, if, if they'll play <laughs> with us. <laughs> Are we getting closer? Or what? He, de- he denies it all the time. I have no idea. I mean, maybe someday they'll play again. Uh, you know, yeah. his new band Corrode is playing with us in New York. So that's, you know, you could see that I've reached out to Will and his projects because uh, we've played with, uh, we've played with Amp, you know, either, Pygmy Lush played with Ampere a couple times and Page 99 played with Longings. Will's not in that band, but members of Ampere and other um, were in, um, no, not Longings, uh, Kindling. Um, uh, they played in Boston. And then, um, yeah, and then Corrode is also a newer band with with uh, the, like Will Plays and Megan and a friend of ours, Matt. The awesome, like, you know, DB, noisy punk. You know, so, you know, but yeah, I just, he's a, he's a musician who I admire and that group of musicians are all good and everything they've done continues to be good. So, you know, er, you know, for a couple of years, uh, at least in 2017 and 2019, I always, I have asked Will or could want to join kind of joking. And he's just like, it's all you buddy. <laughs> but, um, he, yeah, no matter what he does, it's going to be good. doesn't matter. But, uh, yeah, maybe yeah. someday. Maybe someday they'll do a reunion. I hope they. I, I hope when they do, they bug us to play with them. Yeah, I mean, why not? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. So they they just asked us to play, and and we said yes. We the lineup was killer too. I mean, it had like you know friends like Strike Anywhere and you know Catalyst was playing that Converge, and at that time we'd been recording with uh, Pygmy Lush had been recording with Kurt for you know the last five years. So we were stoked to play finally play with Kurt. Kurt's band. <laughs> um, That's awesome. But yeah, I mean, um, that was cool. And then we decided to do a DC show r- right around that same time. It was the same week. It wasn't the, we should have put them like back to back, but it was like a week later, I believe. So how did that first set of shows go? Everything good? Reception good? Everyone happy with each other? Yeah, it was great. Um, it, it got back together with the Document 8 lineup, which I think did the most touring um, together, which we just kind of naturally thought was the kind of most true lineup. I mean, they're, all the lineups for me are, are great. But, um, you know, me and George, Johnny, Blake, and Chris, who've been in the band the whole time. And then, you know, Brandon and Corey, who were in the band for a good bit of time. And, you know... Um, and Brandon, when he joined, has been in the band ever since. Um, so he's been in the band since 2000 and on. Um, and then over the years, we kind of always ask, there's been a rotating third guitar player. Um, and then Mike, so Mike Whitman, um, joined us in 2011. He, Mike Whitman played in Mannequin and Pygmy Lush. Um, he joined us. He joined us for the 2011 shows and it went, it went great. And I, as I mentioned, no repair. No, uh, you know, no damage control needed because I think, you know, when we initially broke up and did our last few shows in 2003, that's where we sort of repaired the, what might've been the loose ends with some of the members. And, um, so yeah, all of us had seen each other and, you know, problem. And most of us have been playing music with each other, you know, like when Pygmy Lush was playing with Johnny, Mike. Chris and I, we were touring with Ghastly City Sleep, who had like, you know, when they started, they had Pat from Majority Rule playing drums, and then Brandon was singing and playing guitar. So 
in a lot of ways, there was five or so members of the whole majority role page 99 gang still on tour together in different bands. So we, we stayed in close contact and continued to play with each other quite a bit. That's good. That's good. So there is there no hurt feelings like, oh, why this lineup and not me? I mean, it sounds like everybody's pretty much getting along, which is good, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, no hurt feelings, though. I, You know, it's like I always think of like trying to include, try to get everybody, you know, like uh, we have a few m- members that just we just aren't, you know, TL. We, you know, we still have love for TL, but TL moved to Florida. We um, he got married and he's I don't know what he's really up to anymore. And uh but we sort of lost touch with him. And then Mike Casto, our first third guitar player, um, we're still in touch with him and see him around, but he kind of, he was kind of busy and stopped playing music himself. And he kind of went and did to do his own thing. And then, you know, Kevin Longin Dyke, who's in city of Caterpillar, he was in the last lineup of page 99 for a year. Uh, he's maybe one of the only people who haven't, joined us who I think would be fun at some point to have him play with us again. But he's also really busy these days with, uh, he's doing city of Caterpillar quite a bit and he runs a, a record store here in our kind of our hometown area full time. He, he does a really killer record store called dig records and vintage. And they've been, uh, they've been doing it for like eight years and to, to much success. Um, nice. And then Jonathan Moore also was the th- last third guitar player of Page Ninety Nine. Um, he he's uh, he's just busy having his life. He has three or four kids. I can't remember. He's just a busy man being a father and doing work. But you know, he did join us when we played in twenty seventeen. He he played with us in Richmond and DC for a couple of the songs that he helped write. So that was really cool. So yeah, we we do try to reach out to you know, and try to like, you know, should we have so-and-so play? But then also, (laughs) I mean, funny enough, we on this tour coming up, we're going to have four guitar players for the first time. (laughs) I don't know. Four. Yeah. We're going to have four. How are you guys all going to fit on stage? Well, most stages, I mean, you know, you can squeeze four people on or like (laughs) nine, I guess it's going to be nine people. We can get up there. I mean, it's just one extra guitar uh, stack really. You know what? You make me feel better because there's five people in my band. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm like, there's no room. How can I even move? But you're like, ah, nine, it'll be fine. So I I just need to not complain. (laughs) Yeah, but you you don't have a lot of room. I mean, if you check out some videos of Page 99, we're pretty squeezed up there. But I get, you know, I don't know what, you know, it's, it is a thing. It's like the feeling, you know, it is like a try to rally up as many of the friends as you can get like in this particular situation on our 2019 uh west coast tour um mike widman was more on the busier side at the time and i just wasn't sure if he could do it um so i had reached out to because i I remember it towards the 27 end of 2017 he was having a hard time making the time to do it just because he was so busy, busy with a business, working himself, and uh, he has kids as well. So um, I think just life was really busy for him at the time. So I, I actually didn't want to bother him. So I reached out to Nate, uh, Nathan Grice, who played in Crestfallen. He played uh, guitar in Crestfallen, and I've been buddies with him ever since. And we asked him to play. And he came to the West Coast and he played with us and that was amazing. And, you know, he's just a great musician. Um, And so this time when we got together, I was like, definitely going to ask Nate. I was like, but Mike and I had talked shortly after the 2019 reunions. And Mike uh, had told me that he was bummed out that he didn't get an ass to play. And I was like, oh, man, I I really thought you were just too busy. I'm, you know you know, I would have wanted you on. So when this came about to happen again, I was like, Mike, if you, if you want to do it, you're, you're free to do it. <laughs> um, we, we would love to have you. When you said you didn't ask Mike, cause you just thought he would be too busy. My first thought was, what if he wasn't, what if he's bummed out that like he didn't get asked? <laughs> right. And he was, he was, um, and it's the whole, well, did you ask? And yeah, I didn't. Um, but at the time, um, we just, we hadn't seen each other a whole lot. Um, actually. And, we just hadn't been as in touch in those two years as, as we, as we've always been. So I just kind of, I just went the past path of least resistance there and, uh, 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, Mike and I are tight. We go way back. So after talking to him, I completely understood. And he definitely got the invite this time because, you know, he's I've I've he's one of my oldest friends and I've played guitar with him probably more than any musician besides maybe Johnny and my brother. Like those those three guys probably done the most shows with in my life. So it's awesome having Mike back in the band, you know, um, because, you know, once you join page 99, you're sort of a part of it, you know, because, you know, everybody comes and yeah, we play these page 99 songs, but the idea is everybody kind of owns them and makes them their own and makes their own racket to it. I mean, page 99, it's kind of a messy band and it's very much characterized by the sum of the parts. So with each person in that band, they kind of add their own feel and touch to it. And I think, um, we just had our first practices like t- a week and a half, two weeks ago or, or so with, with all of us, except for Blake, cause he's the only one who doesn't live in Virginia anymore. He lives in Portland. But so we had a practice with all four guitars, two bass drums and Chris singing. Um, how was that? Oh, uh, it sounded great. I mean, we're just hashing out, hashing out the, uh, you know, the details really. I mean, if I'm being honest, um, Page 99 is a much better band than the first five years we were a band. Like you go back and if I look at, sometimes I'll look back at older videos to reference like a chord I may have forgotten or two and we're just playing awful. (laughs) But (laughs) the thing is, is like it's working because we're just all there and we're all pushing it. It's like, it is a punk band. So if chords are being messed up and, and the feel is right and the crowd's there with you and you're, you're, putting you know you're putting yourself into it at the end of the day what you're what you're playing doesn't have to be perfect just has to be you know you just have to kind of be able to get behind it and play it together so yeah um the band sounds good i mean for all intent and purpose any of those takes we were playing of any of those songs i'd be happy with if we played them live so but we're still yeah still get putting still putting the songs under a microscope for now well because on this particular tour and for the first time ever we'll be playing with a different drummer, which is kind of a big deal for us because Johnny is pretty much like, you know, he's the other half of, of the songwriting process and everything that page 99 done. It's, you know, he's, he's kind of one of the reasons why the band sounds the way it does. So it's kind of a big deal to not be playing with him this time around, but we, have Andy Gale, who was the last drummer in Pygmy Lush. Uh, we played together in Haram, and he's been in other excellent bands. Um, over the, he played drums uh, for Corin McCobb, who Corey, our bass player, played guitar in. <laughs> There's so many intersecting web. There's the tree. The page 99 tree is long and goes forever. But the good thing is, like for certain bands, I'm like, oh, unless these three or four people are in it, I don't care and I don't want to hear it. But for page 99, it's like, it's almost like a collective where, you know, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter who's in it, but basically no matter who's in it, you're going to get a good show. Yeah, I'd like to think that. And that's a good way to put it because I think it, you know, really has turned more into a collective where yeah. the guitar player, uh, literally at this point, if the, all the rest of the guitar players knew the the riffs to all the songs and I couldn't make it for some reason. It's like you're still getting a page 99 show despite like, you know, I, I wrote most of the stuff, but I don't really need to be there if the guys know the songs, but that's kind of the premise. Yeah, you're right. So it could be a rotating cast, but we do try to keep it as, you know, true to, you know, what we were as much as possible. You know, we always wanted to be, you know, you know, when we start missing members, like say Johnny, he's the first of the original lineup that hasn't done any of the reunions. So like if we were missing Blake, Chris, me or George or Johnny, those are sort of like a big deal to me. But like, I do think, like you said, it's a collective and we know we're f- so fortunate to know so many killer drummers and Andy's just one of the many killer, you know, there's Ryan who plays, you know, he plays in, with me and Chris now in uh, terminal bliss. He plays in city of Caterpillar. Um, and in those Pat who plays in no man and majority role, um, our buddy Jake plays in the archaics and triac Eric plays in strike anywhere. I mean, we, we just know so many good drummers. 
So uh, this this time around, and, and I don't know for how long, but Andy's joining us, and he's so far doing a killer job. That's awesome. Let's talk about the shows we have coming up. Now, you're playing New Friends Fest in Toronto. That's uh, Is that the fest that Respire puts on? Yes. Yep. It's that group of guys. That's a great band. I've had uh, two of those guys on the show before. Oh, excellent. Actually, I'm going to have to dig that up and listen to it. Um, yeah, uh, they're excellent. Um, I've never seen them, unfortunately, but uh, a couple years ago, I became uh, privy to who they were and checked them out, and they were great. Another band with a lot of members in it. Yeah, you know what? I saw that you were playing New Friends Fest, and I instant well, I instantly thought of Respire because they put on the fest, but then I was like, oh, Respire does the same thing. They have a ton of people up there. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> and it's awesome. I, and it, it works. See, that's the example of a band uh, taking like like a great deal of members and doing something a little more creative. <laughs> I like everything Page 99 is doing, but like I can hear everything Respire is doing and and they're very, very useful with all the instrumentation. And, you know, it's it's being well done. They're doing what they're doing really well. So. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They, they, a lot of I think there's seven of them, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the, you know, there's the the fundamentals, guitars and drums and bass and all that, and a, a cellist, and I, I can't remember who else. But uh, it's been like three years since I've spoken to them. I think. Yeah. So unfortunately, we won't see them. We have a couple. Yeah, we have a few shows leading up to Toronto, which will be the last show. But um, yeah, those folks have been reaching out to us since we initially reunited for our group of shows in 2017 and we've always tr- tried to see if we could do it and it just it's just never lined up and then this year it, it just ended up working out so I'm, I'm really happy we can finally play but yeah we've been we've been talking about playing for almost almost six years wow yeah 2017 so tell the people where we can see you. We have New Friends Fest. I know we've got some other gigs. We have two sold out shows, unfortunately, so we get, no one else can get into those. Um, but um, we're playing in Richmond at um, at Richmond Music Hall um, with Catharsis, Snowman, and Ghoulie. And then we're playing St. Vitus in Brooklyn um, with uh, Corrode, Catharsis, uh, and Man. And then we did just announce last week or this week, late last week, we announced um, a show we're doing out here where I live, kind of close to where I live at a friend of mine's coffee shop. It's called Hopscotch Coffee and Records. Um, We're playing with Drew from Circle Takes a Square. It's his solo project. They're called Drawn Bow. Um, And it's really neat. It's really cool, experimental, like droney folky pretty and just a little abstract it's really cool so this will be his first show and it's just two bands that's that's just so that's not sold out because there's no tickets it's only five dollars so um and it could hold maybe a hundred maybe 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 a little bit more maybe a little bit less but that show is still available for anyone listening <laughs> listening if they want to make it out to winchester virginia which is all the way out in sticks yeah I mean, why not make it to that one? That that's the one to go to. Small <laughs> venue, right? Intimate. Yeah, no stage. You know, I, you know, it's going to be like a. That was my hope. So, like, one of the things that that I like to try to do, like every time we do these things, is um, to kind of do something like a little bit special and different. So for this, it's just like we kind of wanted to play like you know a more intimate, smaller show to kind of really kind of playing with a different drummer for the first time. Just get knock out a first show uh in case you know we were like had the jitters or anything because kind of playing with a new drummers is different than playing with just a new guitar player uh and then the premise of just playing local and cheap and you know just something you know that that is maybe memorable you know because you know like in all these reunions we're playing stages where, you know, it's mostly a bar and everything in the room is black and there are black curtains and a black painted stage. So the environment's all kind of the same. It's not, we've played a lot of different shows, but a lot of, you know, bigger places. So it's nice to, to be able to do something a little bit smaller, like what we used to do, like a punk show with just plug in and play and go, go for it. 
And what about the future? Maybe some new page 99 music? Hmm? Document 14? Hmm? <laughs> uh, you know, actually, you know, we keep joking about it. And I have more in the last year messed with stuff that could potentially be page 99 stuff than I have ever before. And I definitely think it's because of bands like, you know, you know, Brandon and City of Caterpillar and them doing like a new record. And then, you know, yeah, definitely yeah. contemporaries like, you know, Drums Dream coming out with a new record. And now all the, now the stack of reunions like that you're getting like Sasha and everything. Um, I would love to. I mean, sometimes I'm a little like, you know, is, does, does the world need that? Or, you know, I kind of want to do it because the, the members are all still, you know, we're all actually in Virginia for the first time in many years. So it's more, it's a more of a potential for something happening, but I can't say with any certainty that we'll do it or not. I mean, it's, it's more possible that we would do something like that now than it ever has been, but we'll, we'll see at this point. I'm actually just kind of hoping, I'm hoping the shows go well and everybody feels good about it. Cause I'd, I'd actually like to do some more things if, uh, if the guys are down, I'd love to, I'd love to tour Mexico. I'd love to tour Japan, love to get back to Europe and play some proper shows out there. Um, yeah. And then, you know, there might be a couple of things, you know, a couple of cool things on the horizon too, um, that are in the works may or may not be in the works. If the rest of the guys are listening to this, come on, Mexico, Europe, we'll do Europe over again. <laughs> Mike, all you got to do is show up to practice with one good riff and that's it. We're, we're off to the races. Yeah, maybe they will. I mean, last time at the end of the practice last week or whatever it was, people were like, let's F it. Let's do a new song. <laughs> so, you know, you know, the, you know, the, the vibe is there, the, you know, having fun with it's there. So it's just the timing if we have time. So maybe, I don't know. We'll push them. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, is there any other band you're doing or, or uh, anything we didn't mention that you want to mention in the end here? Um, well, Chris and I still do uh, Terminal Bliss uh, together with Ryan Parrish. Um, we had our an EP on uh, Relapse Records that came out a couple years ago. And we're currently, um, well, after the 99 stuff, we're hoping to get working on writing a full length um, again for Relapse. So that's a band that we're doing and and then Brandon's doing City of Caterpillar and they're on relapse too. I think they they also have like more material that I think they want to do. Um I don't know as far as the rest of the guys I do know um Corey our, um our bass player is talking about maybe doing his project uh Human Body Flawed which is was which is never really played but it was a recording thing. Um, he, he's got a whole lot of really good songs and we've actually been talking about maybe trying to flesh that out and play together, but that's like a, a very tough, that'd be a, up your alley, alley Keith. It's more like metallic hardcore, like Rorschach converge influence, maybe dead guy ish or something like that. Um, but yeah. And you know, pygmy lush, I'm hoping for pygmy lush big time in the future. So we'll see. I mean, that's yeah, you know, my 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 big goal is to be active with music, whether it's uh you know doing something new or still enjoying myself with like the page ninety nine shows. You know, yeah, you've really stayed active this whole time. Yeah, I tried my best. I mean, it's slowed down over the years, but I have never stopped, and I don't intend to. Yeah, same here. You know, what? I uh, I got off track in life for a long time, and I st- kind of st- started to tell myself this story that I was absent from music for a long time, but I never was. I've always done bands like every couple years and kept up my chops, and uh, that's what I want to do, and that's what you're doing too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's good to hear that you're doing it as well. I have to. What <laughs> else am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, I feel I feel you on that one. Start a podcast? No. No, I love that. Now, now, Keith, now that I'm I'm sitting here looking at this microphone, I might have to start a po- podcast of some sort. I don't know if people want to hear me talk, but uh, I think they do. And listen, just be be warned. It's it's a lot of hard work. It's not easy. Yeah, no, I I don't assume it is. It seems like a lot of work behind the scenes. There, that's yeah, that's where all the work is. This part is easy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I admire you for doing it. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I've been following it and I'm like, wow, there's like a new, you know, the podcasters really stay busy. It's like definitely a content after content after content thing. It's a grind. But you know what, Mike? I love it because I get to talk to people like yourself every single week. Oh, that's awesome. I appreciate that. Now, I'm, 
glad to be part of, you know, some of these because I, you know, I enjoy, I'm, I'm a nerd and I enjoy reminiscing and talking about the old days and the current days. I'm a, a music nut. So I love talking music. So here's a question for you. All right. Let, 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 let's say you're on a podcast like this one. Will you listen to the episode when it comes out? This? Oh yeah. I give, I give every podcast a listen just to, to, to hear the flow and then, and then me talk, tell myself how stupid I sound. I mean, not in a self-deprecating way, but I'm, I'm from the sticks in Sterling where we have like a nasally draw. And I can't help but to notice that every single time I hear myself on on a podcast, but it's okay. I like that. I never listen back to anything, which really? is probably well. I, I take that back. I have to edit the whole show, so yeah. I, I I hear it all then, and I still edit every single episode. But I don't listen back after that because I'm too self conscious, and I still don't want to hear myself. <laughs> um, but here's the thing: I'm so vain. That if someone says, "Hey, this part of the show was really good," I'll go. Then I'll go back and listen yeah, to that whole sure. part. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, it, it makes sense. Like you invest yourself into something, so if somebody's going to compliment and and let you know what you're what you are doing, you know that they like what you're doing in particular enough to you know tell you, you're going to want to go back and kind of pull from that and be like, okay, well, if I'm getting more complimented on like pieces, you know, like little moments like this, maybe when I'm finding myself having this conversation, I'll let something like this ride because that turned into something really great, you know, because part of, I guess, having, you know, these things, you know, doing well is just the natural having a, having a loosely composed outline of how it's going to go. And then sometimes just let knowing of when to let it go or knowing when to cut it off. See, Mike, you're a natural. You could do this. (laughs) <laughs> I'll listen back to it and then I'll be like, oh man, I hate that. <laughs> but that's the thing. I'll listen back to it to see how it's edited and everything. And, um, you know, I can definitely tell, you know, some stuff, people make really smart edits and I completely get it because you can't just let it ride. But, um, exactly. But yeah, no, I appreciate the, the, all the work that, that you guys do. And, and in particular, you know, you with your podcast with, with, uh, new scenes, really good. Well, Mike, I want to thank you, one, for all the music you've made over the years, because, I mean, look, look look at the resume. And two, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Absolutely, Keith. I, I had a good time, too, and I appreciate you asking. And uh, keep on keeping on, because uh, you're doing a good job. And I'll actually go after this and dive into a couple more of the episodes I haven't heard yet. And there you have it, Mike Taylor. Excellent, excellent conversation. Great to hear about Page 99. Classic band. Just classic. Glad they're back and doing it. They've got some shows coming up. That's exciting. Maybe some potential new music in the future, too. Hmm? Hmm? Pygmy Lush is great, too. Did you hear that? There's an unreleased Pygmy Lush album just sitting out there, waiting for us to hear it. That's exciting. Terminal Bliss. Have you heard Mike's other band, Terminal Bliss, with Ryan from City of Caterpillar? They're great, too. The guy cannot miss. He's been making a lot of great music over the years, and it was great to hear about his whole history, Page 99, coming up through the years, the reunions, everything. Everything. Excellent stuff. So thank you so much, Mike, for coming on the show. So let's check in, huh? How are we doing? How are we doing? I did manage to catch a gig this weekend. I saw Soft Kill, Ruth Redellet, and Military Gun at the Rainbow Room in Rockefeller Plaza. Now, this was an interesting show. First of all, imagine going to a show in Midtown Manhattan. That's pretty much unheard of. Second of all, imagine going to a show in Rockefeller Plaza, okay? You go in, and the people guide you to the elevator, and you take an elevator up a high rise to go to a show. It was pretty trippy. So the show area wasn't open yet. So we're in some bar area and there's incredible views of Manhattan. You can see the whole city because you're at the top of Rockefeller Plaza. So then we go into the 
room where the actual show is, and it's like a fancy ballroom. There's chandeliers, there's crazy lighting, there's carpeted floors, and more great views of the city. It's unlike anything I've ever been to. These shows, they're called Indie Ballroom. It's put on by Rough Trade, the record store, in conjunction with Rockefeller Plaza. And you know what? I hope they do more because it was a cool venue and it was a great show. Saw Military Gun for the first time and they were really good. Apparently the drummer's flight got delayed and they played with a fill-in who just learned the set right before the show or something. Very impressive. But Military Gun was great. And uh, if everything goes according to plan, someone from Military Gun will be on this show fairly soon. So keep an eye out for that. After Military Gun was Ruth Radelet, Radelet, Radel. Let's go with Radelet. Ruth Radelet. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. It was like soft rock, some vocal stuff with some light keyboard for some songs. I really dug it. It was nice. It was a nice build up to the great Soft Kill. Now, Soft Kill always put on a great show. This is my third time seeing them, and. I think it might be the best time I saw them. The sound was surprisingly good in the Rainbow Room. Surprisingly good. And it was just a great backdrop. You know, I'm looking at Soft Kill. I look out the window, I see an incredible view of Manhattan. And they just always put on a great show. There's not really any more that I can say about it. I did get to say hello to Tobias. He has been on this show before. If you have not heard his episode, I highly recommend it. So. All in all, great show, and shout out to my Shantz crew, Kevin, Brendan, and Ton, and of course, my friend Jonathan, who was there as well. He turned me on to Soft Kill, I think it was sometime last year, and that's how I ended up listening to them and having them on the show. So, all in all, great time. But besides that, I'm just gearing up for this weekend of shows that the Darling Fire has in the Northeast, 819 at Amityville Music Hall in Long Island, New York and 820 at Kung Fu Necktie in Philadelphia. So if you're around, come out. It's going to be a good time. You know, I'm learning some new songs for the headlining set. We're working on some new music. And check this out, okay? So we play in three different tunings for a headlining set. So I bought a third bass because, you know, I want one bass for each tuning because I can't tune up and down on stage. I mess it up. I just want to have the basses in the tunings ready to go. I'm too nerve-wracked on stage. I blank out. I mess up the tuning. It's, a, you know, I'd rather just have them all ready to go. So I bought a bass, a third bass. It's a Fender American Precision, and I get it, and it's great. You know, I get it all set up for the tuning we have. I'm learning the songs. Great. Okay. So this leads somewhere, so stick with me. So I eat, and I typically eat in my living room, right? I have my couch, a coffee table. This is where I eat. So I sit down, and all of a sudden I smell cat piss. And I'm like, where on earth could that be coming from? It just appeared out of nowhere. I don't have a cat. There's no cats here. And, you know, I I sit down, I catch a whiff of it, and I'm, I get up, I'm looking around, nothing. And I keep, every time I sit down to eat in the living room, I smell it. So if I f- start going crazy, I'm smelling the couch. I'm trying to identify a smell. I pull out the couch. I clean under the couch. I clean the floors, I clean the wall, I clean the coffee table, I sit down again, still smell the cat piss. I'm like, is it coming from outside? It's summertime. Is it coming from the backyard? Where on earth could this be coming from? Well, so I'm like, okay, what changed? What changed recently? The bass, the bass guitar that I bought, the case is in my living room, sitting in front of the coffee table, and I grab it, and I smell it, and I get a big whiff of cat piss. And I'm like, oh my God. So you you have no idea how crazy this was driving me. It was like seriously decreasing the quality of my life day to day. So I would try to clean the case off, but it's too bad. It's bad. It's really bad. So I'm getting rid of it. I put it out front of my apartment and hopefully somebody takes it. So mystery solved. I'll get a new case and that'll be that. What else is going on? Did you hear about these UFO congressional hearings? Now, I think this is pretty interesting stuff. David Grush, who served for 14 years as an intelligence officer in the Air Force and National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, 
appeared before Congress and said that the government does have a UFO retrieval program and they have retrieved craft and that they have even retrieved alien beings. How about that? And they even had some people testify who have had sightings. You know those sightings that were declassified and by the government and they released the videos and you can see UFOs shooting around and, you know, it's like the blurry black and white footage, all that stuff. The stuff that uh, apparently Tom DeLong from Blink-182 helped declassify. Now, I have to admit, I did not believe any of this stuff before, right? Because you usually hear it's some guy from Alabama or somewhere else and he got abducted and then he came back and there's just not much credence to it. But now that we have congressional hearings and people testifying, I have to say, I'm slightly more convinced. So I'm interested to see where that goes. What do you think? Yes or no? Real or not? So that's it. That is it for this week. I'm back next week with a very special guest. I'm going to give you a very vague hint as to who it is, okay? This is somebody I've been waiting to have on the show since I started doing the show, okay? It's a landmark band for me, and I'm very excited for you to hear this. So I'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest. So thanks, everybody, for listening, and... Until next time.